Um, I'm Martin Glynn, speaking on behalf of RBI Associates Limited. Um, this evening's webinar is on the subject of regulations and incentives for woodland management. Uh, the webinar will take about an hour or so, we'll aim to finish by six o'clock, um, allowing about 40 minutes or so for the presentations and then some questions and answers afterwards. So as I just said, if you do have any questions, do please put them into the chat function and we'll take them at the end of the session. Um, this evening, I'm joined by Richard Powell, the Forestry Commission's Partnership and Expertise Manager for Yorkshire and the North East. He'll be talking to us about grants and licences, um, and I'll be handing over to Richard in a minute. Just before we do that, I'll just um, do the usual sort of introductions. I, I've mentioned I'm speaking on behalf of RDI Associates, um, who are a forestry and project delivery company working on a sort of range of sectors and projects. Um, we also have on the call this evening Will Richardson, the director of RDI Associates. So between us, we'll be able to hopefully cover any questions and queries that we might get. And both Will and I are members of the Institute of Chartered Foresters with quite extensive experience of the forestry sector one way or another, probably more years than either of us care to remember, really. So, um, so just a little bit about the, um, the project that we're working on, um, the, the webinar's part of the Woodland Management Focus Area Pilot Project, which is funded by the Forestry Commission through the Woods Into Management Forestry Innovation Fund. And what we're doing through that is using geographic information system to identify clusters or focus areas of unmanaged woodlands, and then working with the woodland owners in those areas. We're also running this woodland webinar program and undertaking further support and advice, um, and an undertaking evaluation of woodland status against something called the United Kingdom Forestry Standard which we've talked about in other webinars to date. And if you, if you haven't been able to uh, attend those, um, I want to know a bit more about the UKFS or any other subjects, then do please, if you go onto the YouTube channel, which we'll send you a link to later, then you can um, watch those webinars again. So uh, just uh, uh, what's this evening's webinar about? Um, woodland regulations incentives, we're gonna be looking at woodland management grants, felling licenses, taxation and planning permission um, going into each of those in varying degrees of detail um, uh, according to the sort of the time that we've got available. So um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Richard Pow from the Forestry Commission um, to talk about woodland management grants and felling licenses. Richard do you want to unmute yourself and I'll hand over to you. Thank you Martin and um... Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, um, the session and to this particular slot from, from, from me at the Forestry Commission. Um, you should never start with an apology, should you? But I'm, I'm going to, um, in that this isn't my presentation and I've, um, I've come in quite late to pick up on this. So if I'm stumbling slightly, that's, you know, that's the reason why. Um, but I shall rely on my... <coughs> um, experience I suppose to, um, to help me through this and I'll try and convey for you the the essence of what can actually be quite a complicated picture nowadays in terms of the array of different incentives that the Forestry Commission offers and the um, slight complexities around some of the regulations so I'll try and I'll try and um, keep it simple and, and of course you'll always have the option of looking back on on this when it's on YouTube to um, figure out any of the detail for yourselves as you, if, if you miss anything as we go. So um, I think the first thing I'll say is just to remind everyone that forestry really is a long-term business. Um, and like anything long-term, you really do need a plan if you're gonna do it properly. So several years ago now, we made a, a kind of mandatory requirement for the grants that we provide for woodland management activity to be supported by a woodland management plan. So in other words, you need to do a woodland management plan first, and that opens the gateway to, to the other support that the Forestry Commission can provide. So, so begin with a plan is, is, is the number one take home message, I, I suppose, from this session. Um, once you've got a woodland management plan, you can access the other funding, and I'll talk about that funding in turn, but let's perhaps first focus on the on, on the woodland management plan and the, and the grant aid that we've got to support the production of that. So, so we have this thing called um, a woodland management planning grant. And that, that's not a grant to do work in the wood per se, but it's a grant to help with the cost of producing the plan. 
And as I say, the plan is what the plan is the, the key in the lock that turns the door to access the funding. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a one-off payment to produce the plan. Uh, we expect the plan um, to cover a 10-year period. Um, and those of you that followed the previous sessions hopefully understand what the UK forestry standard is, and it should go without saying that the plan needs to be compliant with the, with the UK forestry standard. Next point, Michael. So you can apply for this bit of funding to create your plan at any time of year. Uh, it's not one of these funds that has a particular window of six weeks or two months that is common nowadays for um, for array of different financial support. This, you know, this particular fund is available all year round, which is a good thing. Um, and essentially the bigger the woodland, the more we'll pay because in general terms, it will take you longer to produce a plan for a, a large, particularly a large and complex wood than it will for a, a, a small and, and simple wood. Um, the smallest woodland that you can, well, let me start that again. The smallest application for woodland um, management planning grant is, is three hectares, but that can be made up of a number of smaller woods. So, so you get a thousand pounds as long as you exceed that th three hectare threshold. Um, and up to woodlands uh, of 50 hectares in size in total. And then I won't read through these other lines. You get the, you get the message. The bigger the woodland, um, the, the higher the payment, up to a, up to a ma maximum threshold. Um, there, is, there is a kind of economy of scale issue at play here in that it doesn't take you twice as long to produce a plan for a, for a, for a 500 hectare wood as it does for a 250. And that's kind of reflected in the way the payment's geared. One of the advantages of, um, of applying for a 10-year um, management plan um, is that it enables you to gain a, a felling license for a 10-year period. Um, normally, when we issue felling licenses, they're for two or three years. Um, and when I say normally, I mean the kind of standalone felling licenses, as they're often called. So if you if you come to us as a woodland owner or an agent for a woodland owner, and you simply want to fell a bit of woodland and replant it, or you want to thin an area of woodland, and you don't have a management plan, we would normally expect you to do that work within a pretty limited period, within a two, three year period normally. Um, and obviously for felling, we'd expect you to restock it. If, if you create a woodland management plan, um, one of the advantages, as I say, enables you to phase that felling over over a ten year ten year period, um, which gives that added flexibility. And the reason we do that is that, in the context of a wider plan, um, the felling can be um, scheduled in a sensible way over the relatively long term, and we can make an assessment of that when we're assessing the plan and check that we're comfortable. I've mentioned this already, yeah, minimum area of three hectares, minimum block size, half a hectare. So you could, for example, have six half hectare blocks and you'd, you'd be eligible because they add up to three hectares in total. Last but not least, in terms of the key eligibility criteria, you, you have to, because this is countryside stewardship funded, um, so the money comes uh, from the RPA, you need to be registered with the RPA. Uh, in order to, um, in order to, in order for us to progress your application, so RPA registration is necessary. Do allow a bit of time for that. It, it's quicker than it used to be. Things have improved, um, but don't expect it to be turned around within a matter of days or weeks. It, you know, it's, it's normally it's normally something that will take months to, to be honest. So allow time for that. Okay, next slide. So, um, so I've talked about the support we provide to, uh, to enable you to produce a, a wooden management plan. You, you don't, I should, I should emphasize, you don't have to come to us for a grant to uh, offset the cost of producing that plan. You, you can just produce your own plan with, without grant. And as long as uh, the Forest Commission have seen that and agreed that it's a sensible plan, um, that'll enable you to access 
the other funding, including what I'm going to talk about now, the concert stewardship, higher tier funding, um, sometimes just called an improvement grant, but it's, it comes from um, concert stewardship stable, um, and it's money available for um, offsetting the costs of doing work appropriate in terms of the management of that, of that woodland on a, on a kind of sustainable long-term basis. Um, the key, there's a number of key kind of priorities that, that we've got as, as part of wider government, um, improving biodiversity, probably won't come as, as a surprise, but also um, improving or making the woodland more resilient in the face of climate change. So this kind of adaptation uh, agenda there. Um, I, I mentioned that before, you, you don't necessarily need to come to us for funding. Most people do, but you don't have to come to us for funding, but you do need a plan that we've approved, whether or not we've, we've provided a grant um, to offset the cost of producing it. Um, there is, un unlike with the support we provide for production of management plans, there is a specific application window for higher tier. Um, and it's the spring, essentially, just, just have in mind the spring. Um, it kind of goes into the early summer, depending on whether, whether it's what we call a mixed scheme or a woodland only scheme. And by that, I mean, if, um, if for example, you're a farmer and you're wanting to apply for CS agri-environment options on your farm, as well as, woodland management options, you would submit what we call a mixed scheme that will be led by the uh, by Natural England, um, but they kind of bring us in to provide the specific technical advice on the, on the woodland bits of that plan. So that's a mixed scheme, or it could be a woodland only scheme, you have the option of applying um, for a woodland only scheme. So there are the two types. In both cases, there's an application window, it's kind of spring, early summer. Next one. Richard, can I just say you're drifting in and out slightly on the audio? I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. What the problem is, but um, just, just to let you know anyway. Okay. All right. um, yeah, sorry, I could hear you perfectly okay. Hopefully that'll improve. I don't know whether, I'm not sure there's anything at my end I can do to improve that. I've closed down other things. But do let me know if it becomes um, unmanageable. Um, Might be the mic sensitivity setting, says Chloe Rose. Okay. You're okay now. So that's fine. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, yeah, so applications made during the application window, minimum, minimum size three hectares. That kind of reads across from what I was saying about uh, the grant available to support the costs of producing a management plan. Um, but we've got a lower threshold, just one hectare if it's triple SI woodland, um, so it's obviously special. And, and half a hectare minimum block size. Um, so, so same area eligibility figures as you were hearing earlier from me. Um, so there's, there's two types of funding essentially through uh, concise stewardship higher tier. There's a standard area-based payment. So you get 100 pounds per hectare of woodland that you've got. Um, and you get that every year for five years. Um, and that's, that's a payment for, a do, for doing what one would normally regard as appropriate ongoing woodland management activity in that wood. So for example, it could include deer management, it could include control of, of rhododendron or, or other invasive exotic species, it could include squirrel control, it could include managing the woodland to sustain a certain amount of deadwood habitat. Uh, it could include ride maintenance. So these kind of standard woodland management activities, um, you, you put those down in your application and we say, yeah, that sounds about right. And we'll pay you £100 per hectare per year for five years uh, as, a as, a, as a contribution towards your costs for doing those. In addition, there are, there are what we call capital items. So if this specific work in the wood that um, we've agreed is appropriate. Um, high seats, as it says here, any fencing work, gates, that kind of thing. You know, so if the woodland is, is currently getting grazed by sheep or cattle and it, and, it, and it requires those to be excluded for a period, then we'll pay for renewal of the fences, uh, for example. And then in addition to this, 
um, will pay up to 40% of the costs of woodland infrastructure. What we mean by that is roads, tracks, um, turning circles, stacking bays, that kind of thing. So the costs that you'll incur as a result of putting infrastructure in the woodland in order to get timber out of that woodland will pay 40% of those, um, of those costs. And that's based on you getting um, three quotes and agreeing the most appropriate quote and then there's paying on the basis of that quote. So they're kind of, it's 40% of actual costs. Um, new revised management plan by 31st of December. There's a little bit of slippage on that, but essentially what we want people to do is make sure they've got a management plan approved in time to make their application in the, in the spring stroke early summer application window for, for higher tier funding. So that was a quick run through of the grants side of things. Um, hoping that you can, can hear me okay. How's the audio? Yeah, okay. I'll continue with the felling licenses then. So switching to the kind of regulation side of our business. Um, the, little, the little booklet that's pictured in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen is, is, is the, um, I'd recommend you, you get a copy of that. You can, you can pluck a PDF off the gov.uk website, the Forestry Commission bit of gov.uk, uh, really useful reference. But I'll run through some of the key things for you to be aware of now. Um, first one is normally, and I say normally because there's exceptions, but normally you, you require a felling license that you get from the Forestry Commission for felling more than five cubic metres of timber in any one calendar quarter. Um, by calendar quarter, I mean, you know, divide the year into four starting at the 1st of January. Um, say normally, I think there might be one or two exceptions listed. If not, I'll go through those. Um, yeah, well, as I said earlier, it, if you apply for a felling license as a standalone, um, it says five years here. We've got discretion over that. Sometimes they're five years, sometimes they're just two or three years. It depends on the particular circumstance and the urgency with which the felling needs to take place and a number of other factors. But yeah, between two and five years, obviously, is the normal duration. Conditional felling licenses. Now, just to be clear, what we mean by a conditional felling license is that a is is a license that is that we issue on the condition that the area of woodland fell is replanted. So, a conditional license. Some some people call conditional felling licenses felling licenses, and the unconditional ones thinning licenses. Simply because if you're applying for a felling license to do just thinning work, so silvicultural thinning work, where you don't need to restock, um, that, that's a felling license, but often referred to as a, as a, as a thinning license. Um, but I don't want to confuse you, I just thought I'd mention that because some people do use that terminology. In essence, they're all felling licenses, they're all covered by the 1967 Forestry Act, and we essentially go through the same process uh, with them. It's just one will require you to sign up to the conditions and with thinning, thinning licenses, we obviously don't because there is no condition. Um, other than following normal good forestry practice, of course. Um, we we'll put these on the public register. The public register is a, is a means by which the public can comment on any proposals for either woodland creation, uh, woodland removal or felling and replanting of, of woodlands. So they sit on this public register over a 28 day period and anyone can, can comment on that. We also consult with relevant consultees. So for example, if it's if, if the woodland's in a triple SI or it's adjacent to a triple SI or a SAM, a SPA, or a SAC or all these scheduled ancient monuments or in some other way it's environmentally sensitive, then we would consult with the normal, with the, the relevant authority just to check what you're proposing is something that they can change if you will. Um, you know, and, and, and sometimes the local community will come back and say, oh, we don't like this, and we'll have a conversation with, with the applicant. And they'd, the, the application might adjust slightly as a result of taking account of any local comment or concern. Um, yeah, and further, further guidance available online. 
I will just very quickly mention the exemptions because they're quite important if we've got time, Martin, just two seconds. Yeah, fine. So, so if, the, if the trees are in a, in a garden, a cemetery, um, public open space, they're exempt from the requirements of a license. If you've got planning permission for a local planning authority, so your local council, you don't need a felling license. The planning permission, if, for example, you get planning permission to, to build a house and to do so, you would need to clear a bit of woodland. You don't need to come to us separately for, for a felling license. The planning permission covers that. Um, very small trees are exempt, and I mean very small. So if you're coppicing anything less than 15 centimetres or six inches, it's exempt. If you're thinning, it's 10 centimetres at breast height, it's exempt. If you clear felling, it's, it's seven centimetres of breast height. It's exempt. Um, so if you have in mind all but the very small um, and, and coppice that's in rotation, um, coppice that's in rotation, very small, very, very small trees exempt, everything else not exempt, unless it's in one of the categories that I gave earlier. It's a bit more complicated than that, but um, I've given you the, um, the bare bones of those. Thank you. This next slide, which was, came out of order, so we're back to tree health grants, I'm afraid. So. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, we, we provide some support for, um, to offset the costs of replanting woodlands where they've had to be felled for reasons of tree health. So, as it says here, the kind of restoration costs that you face in replanting a woodland that's been affected. I'm kind of calling, I'm kind of thinking decimated, you know, not just one or two trees within a woodland that have got tree health problems, but where there's a where there's a kind of mappable area that, that needs re, replanting as a result of a particular um, tree health um, problem. Um, so the Support comes in two forms. It's, it's kind of support associated with the cost of removing the dead or dying trees. Um, and that might not just be trees. It could, in the case of Phytophthora remorum, host species includes rhododendron, so it could be the cost of removing that as well as the, uh, as, as well as the replacement costs. Thankfully, in the northeast of England, we've got very few disease problems currently. Um, in Yorkshire, it's getting a little bit worse in that we've got Phytophthora uh, in the southern and most western parts of, of Yorkshire now, and, and also relatively isolated cases at large in, in, in the North York Moors. Um, but thankfully, at the moment, in this part of the world, we don't have the disease problems that they've got in, for example, the southeast or the southwest or indeed the north, northwest. So hopefully you won't need to draw on this grant, is, is what I'm hinting at. <laughs> next, next point. Yeah, so it's open all year round. Um, you've obviously not got control over when you need to respond to these disease problems or, or you've got the mercy of the disease largely. Um, yeah, and the payment rates are there. Um, I think that's self-explanatory. I mean, essentially, as you'll probably quickly appreciate, is that we're paying more for the most precious sites. Um, you know, so ancient, ancient woodland is, a, is an irreplace, irreplaceable resource. And so we're, you know, we're, we're providing particular encouragement, some might say particularly generous encouragement, others, others might not agree, but we're providing more financial encouragement for um, restoration of native species in ancient woodland. I don't mean to go through these. I hope they, they kind of make sense. Fairly and then we've just included a brief slide about woodland creation as well. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind just mentioning a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, it's kind of topic in its own right, but just very briefly, because I know we're, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, if you are interested in creating new woodlands, yeah, these are the, 
the four main sources of funding from the Forestry Commission to be aware of. There is other sources of funding available from Wood and Trust and, and by, um, by DEFRA more directly, for example, through the Trees for Climate Funding Community Forests. But in terms of Forestry Commission um, funding, um, you know, these, these, these are the four main sources. Just very briefly then, Wooden Creation Planning Grant, this, is a, this, this isn't a grant for planting trees or managing and maintaining trees per se. It's a little bit like the Woodland Management Planning Grant. You know, it's a grant to help with the cost of doing all the planning and prep work, all the surveys, analysis of that survey information, um, studying ESC, et cetera, et cetera, that you would need to do in order to develop a, a robust and well thought through Plan. And this isn't for tiny woodlands, this is for woodlands at, at scale. It was originally only aimed at woodlands over 30 hectares, which would, would since reduce that to five hectares. Um, England Woodland Creation Offer, this is a kind of flagship capital grant to support woodland creation. Now, and the ambition is that much of the government's woodland creation uh, ambition will be achieved through uh, through woodland that's funded through the England Woodland Creation Offer. Um, we're offering 100% of standard costs. It doesn't mean in every single case we're going to cover everyone's costs at the rate of 100%, but based on standard cost averages across the country, that's the kind of intervention rate, as we call it, that we're paying that. So it's pretty, it's pretty generous in that respect, and it's quite broad. We'll fund woodland creation from one hectare upwards in terms of in terms of scale of scheme. Um, lots of options in terms of species choice as well. Um, not more than 50% of any one species. That's the main criteria. And obviously the species have got to be suitable for the, for the site and the location. CS Woodland, uh, CS Woodland Creation Grant. This, this was on offer before we introduced UCO and it's still sat, sat there in the background. Very few people are going for that now because the grant rates on offer are higher for England Woodland Creation offers, Offer than they were for, for CS Woodland Creation Grant, but it's still there as an option if you want to go down the route. And la last but not least, the, the Woodland Carbon Guarantee. Um, again, this isn't, this isn't a grant for planting trees per se. It's, it's essentially the government guaranteeing a price for the carbon that your woodland will accrue as it grows over the years. So, so it's government putting a bottom into the market, it's kind of guaranteeing that you'll get X pounds per hectare um, for your woodland carbon units. Um, again, this is a subject in its own right, no, no time to go into the detail. Um, but it, it's, it's essentially there <clears throat> to give people the peace of mind that at the very least, they'll achieve the, the rate that they've agreed with the Forestry Commission. Um, and it works on the basis, it's a competitive process, works on the basis of kind of an auction where you submit your application, you bid, you say, okay, my bid is 16 pounds a ton for the carbon or whatever. And, and, and if that bid is competitive compared with the others, we'll, 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 we'll draw up agreement with you promising that. Yeah, but carbon is a separate subject. We can run a whole separate seminar on, <laughs> on that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, we'll come back to you with some questions later on, but we'll give you five or ten minutes now just to sort of have a, have a break and rest your voice. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to um, talk now about some um, taxation and also planning permission. I'm, I'm going to sort of get through these things fairly quickly, um, partly because they, um, you know, we, we don't seem to be experts on these things. Um, but I think the important point to make, well, two important points is one is that both taxation and planning permission are very complex subjects and you really do need to take professional advice on these. What we're just trying to raise here is the fact that both for the purposes of taxation and planning permission, woodlands and forestry activities are treated differently to many other activities. So it's just worth knowing that. Um, so that you can then take the advice um, where necessary. In terms of taxation, I'm going to be dealing with those uh, 
listed there, capital gains and inheritance tax, um, sort of two similar treatments there in a way, also income and corporation tax and then VAT. Um, so, um, and I've taken the information there from uh, an information note that COM for the, the Trade Association for Forestry has published, so thank you to them for the information. And also I've said that, you know, this please does not constitute advice, so we really do need to check with um, taxation advisor on this subject. So in terms of capital gains tax, um, generally speaking, um, it's not payable on the gain in value, in value attributable to the trees. Um, but any value, increasing value of the underlying land is assessable, but you can set aside any capital works that you've undertaken. So what that means really is that um, woodlands are not, um, don't come under the, the auspices of capital gains tax. Um, they are also, uh, you can use them for rollover relief. So for example, if you've sold another, um, uh, qualifying business asset, you know, if you sold another business or a property or something, then you can roll over that asset into woodlands. And it does mean that that relief continues to apply. And also this slightly going into sort of inheritance tax. If, if then the, the holder does die um, during that period, any, any um, uh, liabilities are, are wiped out at that point. Um, and I should say also that non-commercial woodlands are subject to normal capital gains tax rules. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about what is a commercial woodland and what isn't a commercial woodland. So that's capital gains. So clearly, you know, a good benefit there. And it's one of the reasons why many people do invest in forestry, because essentially, as long as you meet the requirements of managing the woodlands, then the, the woodland itself is not um, liable to capital gains tax. Just this issue about the underlying land compared to the value of the trees. Generally speaking, in most valuations, the value of the underlying land is relatively small. Um, it's quite a, a you know, minor proportion of the value as land on the whole. Most of the value in woodlands is within the trees themselves. So just going on to inheritance tax, sort of similar treatment in many respects. Again, um, so commercial woodlands um, attract 100% business property relief, uh, provided the transfer, as it's called, as owned, in other words, the owner, has owned the, the relevant business property for a minimum of two years immediately before the transfer. If the woodland is a relatively small woodland, perhaps owned as part of a, a farm, then it would probably come under agricultural um, uh, property relief in that sense, rather than business property relief. So uh, just worth bearing that in mind. There are also some particular requirements, or sorry, um, eligibilities around um, what's known as heritage relief. So if land's sort of in you know, an outstanding scenic area, perhaps part of a historic property or scientific interest, for example, then it may well be eligible for heritage relief. That's a fairly unusual situation and it's not the sort of thing you just get for being in a national park or an AOB, for example. There does have to be a particular um, sort of aspect to it there. So, um, so again, basically, as long as you've owned the woodland for two years uh, before the transfer, then basically it means that woodland, uh, commercial woodland, um, is exempted from inheritance tax. So that's the important point to take away from that. In terms of income and corporation tax, treating those two uh, as in the same purposes, really, um, the income from timber is not, um, you know, there's no income or corporation tax on those two. Now it does, it's important to emphasize that that relates to timber income, not other forms of income from commercial woodlands. So for example, if you're undertaking some sort of recreation business, shooting, leisure business, et cetera, then they are treated in the normal way. It is just the income from timber that's not liable to income tax or corporation tax. So I just said uh, profits from the sales of timber are tax-free. Uh, income tax if you're a personal occupier or uh, a corporation tax if it's a business. Um, and then rents and other revenue receipts from woodlands are liable to income tax. So if you're letting the woodland out to anybody else or for you know, a, a paintballing, something like that, then, then that, that is liable for income tax. And no relief from income tax is given for expenditure incurred in commercial woodlands. So what that means is that whereas the income um, is not taken into account in terms of your income, but similarly expenditure isn't either. So in other words, um, you can't set aside the expenditure on woodland against other income. 
So essentially, um, income from timber is outside the, the sort of income tax regulations by and large. In terms of VAT, um, uh, basically timber is treated in, in the same respect as any other product or service in that sense. So those registered for VAT must charge VAT on all timber sales. Um, if you're not currently um, providing any taxable supplies, but intending to do so at a later date, and clearly for a lot of people who are producing timber, that does apply because it might be they've got a growing woodland, but not doing anything at the moment, or perhaps they're in a year where it's not producing any timber, um, then you can register for VAT as an intended trader, as it's called, which does mean that you can then, of course, reclaim VAT on any inputs. And it's the standard rate of VAT, which is currently chargeable on all timber products, including fuel wood. So if you're selling firewood or biomass to a wholesaler, you would charge the standard rate of VAT, which is currently 20%. You would only charge the lower rate of VAT of 5% um, if it's going as fuel directly to the general public for domestic use. So that's a, a matter of some confusion amongst people. So if you're you know, if you're selling it as firewood to a wholesaler, you would still be charging the 20% if you're VAT registered. And then, um, as I said earlier on, in terms of what is a commercial woodland, and that's important for the purposes of um, inheritance and capital gains tax, um, these, these reliefs are only available to occupiers of commercial woodland. Now, there's no legal definition of what commercial means in this sense, um, but some of the factors that might be taken into account by HMRC in making a decision will include the following, um, whether or not you've got a woodland management plan, which we talked about earlier on, whether you have a professional advisor, whether you have dedicated accounts um, for the woodland itself, uh, whether, the, uh, whether you have sort of VAT registration for the, the woodland business, and whether you have any records of trading. So as I say, they are only examples and they are not in themselves definitive, uh, but they are the sorts of things that HMRC will take into account in deciding whether or not your woodland is being managed commercially. So if you just have an area of woodland, which you aren't really keeping any accounts for, you have no management plan, if you're not taking any professional advice on, and if you don't keep separate accounts for, then the chances are that HMRC won't be considered as commercial for the purposes of inheritance tax or capital gains. And they have been tightening up on this a bit in recent years. So it is really important that if you are thinking about taxation benefits of woodlands, that you do make sure that you satisfy those criteria. Okay, so then just very briefly about planning permission, we'll just talk about roads and tracks, buildings and operations, and again, a uh, you know, complex issue um, we, we, you know this doesn't really constitute professional advice so please do check with an advisor before you make any decisions um, the town and country planning act um, does include what's known as permitted development rights under class e forestry developments um, and uh, this is a direct quote here from the from the town and country planning act so or town and country planning order actually for this sense um, and what it says is that the carrying out on land used for the purposes of forestry, including a forestation, i.e. planting of trees, um, the development reasonably necessary for these purposes, which can include the erection, extension or alteration of a building, formation, alteration or maintenance of private ways and otherwise tracks and access routes um, and operations on that land um, to do with obtaining materials. In other words, you know, perhaps winning materials for purposes of, of uh, building roads and other operations, not including engineering or mining operations. Um, things which um, are not included um, would be the provision or alteration of a dwelling. So just because you might have own a woodland and you might be working in that woodland does not seem that this in any sense negates the normal requirements of planning permission. Um, there's also some very particular requirements there in terms of whether you're close to an aerodrome or not. Um, I assume that most people aren't for the purposes of this webinar. Um, this is uh, an important one, is if you are within 25 metres of the metalled portion of a trunk road or classified road, in other words, a public highway, um, th these permitted development rights don't apply. And also, um, and this is one that was brought in when biomass boilers started becoming popular, that if you are essentially sort of buying in uh, fuel, or storing waste from those, then, um, then it can only relate to um, fuel, which is originates from the woodland uh, itself, where the, the biomass boiler is. 
Um, and in terms of what the conditions are, this is an important bit in a way, is that um, you just because it does constitute permitted development, you still have to apply for the local planning authority for a determination, as it's called. So it's not planning a planning application as such, but you have to submit a determination, uh, which could include details such as, um, you know, the materials to be used, um, where the site is, uh, and these sorts of things. And then the local authority have 28 days um, to reply to that. Now, that is just two conditions amongst many uh, in, the, in the order. So as I say, there other conditions do apply. Uh, there are lots of other conditions and in some areas the local authority uh, might have uh, removed these rights or restricted them they, they do have that the right to do that um, uh, it's not it's not that usual but in AOMBs or um, national parks for example then some authorities may remove some of these rights so again well worth checking before you do anything so so but again the important point there is that if it is you know, a building or a track that you're putting in the sort of woodland that directly relates to the management of that woodland, then uh, you may well be eligible for permitted development rights rather than going through the full app planning application process. I think that's the, you know, the point to take away, if you like. So um, just we're just going to go on to questions and answers in a minute. Um, so if you have got any, then do please put them into the um, chat and we'll take those but just whilst we're doing that um just a bit of promotion for the next webinar next tuesday evening same time five o'clock same place um subject matter is on selling your timber about making sure you get the best value for your timber my colleague will richardson will be talking about the various different ways of um selling timber you know whether that's by standing or roadside or through an auction or direct sale um timber prices generally speaking are pretty good at the moment although that may be affected by um the, the storm before for Christmas, um, still to be determined in a way, um, but all the more important that you're using the optimum method to get that so that you can maximise the return from your timber. So uh, so that's, as I say, next Tuesday at five o'clock. Um, we will send an invitation to everybody, um, but if you know of anybody else who wants to join them, please let us know. We'll encourage them to, um, to put in uh, an application. So, um, so okay so we're now going to go on to any questions what time is it it's quarter two so we should have time to deal with those um so richard if you'd like to unmute your microphone we've got a few questions here which i think most of them refer to you um and i will also ask the questioner to unmute themselves and ask their question as we go along um if you don't want to do that and just let me know and i will ask the question on your behalf so um, the first one is from JP, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, if you're there. Um, yep, hello there. Hello. Um, we, we are just marginally below that three hectare limit. What can we do? <laughs> you mean the three hectare limit for wood and creation planning yeah. grant? Because we were just in the process of, of looking at a woodland management plan and um, we're just too small for your for your grant, right? So just let me be clear: is this an existing woodland measuring two point six three hectares, or are you thinking of creating a woodland of that size? No, it's it's existing. Existing, right? Okay. Um, yeah, and that's it, and that, in, and that's the only woodland you have, is it? You haven't got any other woodland I, I property. Suppose. I mean, if, if we cooperated with our with our next door neighbour who's got another parcel, we'd probably creep over the three hectares. Uh, OK, that that might be possible. Um, it, it can be complicated from an RPA perspective if you've got different single business identifiers, etc. But that might be possible. Are the woodlands immediately adjacent? Uh, yes. Right, so it's in effect one block. Yes, could with be. With an ownership boundary between, yeah. Might be possible. Um, I mean, it'd be worth talking to the local woodland officer about it to um, to see whether we can navigate our way through. It won't be simple, I warn yeah. you, in terms of the bureaucracy. Yeah, but, um, on Monday. <laughs> yeah, you say you're seeing them on Monday? Yes. Ah, well, there you go. There's a, there's a question for you to ask. Um, otherwise, I would hope 
with the benefit of the advice that the Woodland Officer can provide you with, um, you, you may well be able to produce, perhaps with the benefit of some external advice, but arguably not too much, you, you may well be able to produce um, a, um, you know, a decent woodland management plan for, you, for your own benefit and then just work on the basis of any of standard own felling licences for any uh, thinning or felling that you want to do. But I think it's going to be really difficult for you to access any grant aid through countryside stewardship Given the given the scale of woodland that you've got, notwithstanding what I said earlier about the possibility of being able to work in conjunction with your neighbouring owner and adding those areas together to get you over that three hectares. Right? Well, fair enough. I mean, if if we have to pay to get the plan, then we'll we'll get a plan because uh, I think we need one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the three hectare threshold is a bit arbitrary. You know, I, there's no real reason why a, a two point six three why it's not worth having a plan for a 2.63 hectare woodland. It's, it's in some landscape context, it's still a reasonably large wood. So I would encourage, even though, even though we might not be able to fund it or provide any grant through countryside stewardship, I, I think it's still a good idea to have a plan and, and work to a plan. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks both. Um, next question is from Joe. I'm going to ask that question um, on Joe's behalf. Um, can we do these plans ourselves or does it have to be by a consultant? And are there any templates for this? Richard, over to you. Yeah, um, you, you can produce the plan yourself, but if the, if the woodlands have any scale or it's complex, we would always encourage you to, to seek the advice of a, of a professional and quite often, um, you'll find an agent that will do the plan in return for the grant. So there'll be no net cost to you as the, as, as, as the owner, or that net cost might be a very small one, um, but worthwhile because, as I say, it enables you to access subsequent countryside stewardship higher tier payments. So, yeah, do get advice. You may or may not be able to do it yourself, submit it yourself based on your your your, your Knowledge and experience, but I would I would I would I would encourage you to get advice. Um, there are templates um, available, and you can access those through um, through the forestry bit on on gov.uk. Um, I think if you probably I've not tried it, but if you just googled woodland management plan template, you'd probably come up with something. I don't know whether Martin or Will want to want to try that while they're talking, see if we can find it, or whether we could perhaps include a link. Um, to it in the chat. Will's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, we will provide some links to those, no problem at all. It's just worth mentioning the My Forest um, application, the online uh, woodland management planning um, uh, open source uh, bit of software uh, called My Forest. Um, it's got some really good uh, resources on there. And we're actually working with them as part of this uh, project, aren't we, Martin, to, to look at at um, more simplified ways of, of uh, introducing the concept of woodland management planning to those, you know, where it might be, um, uh, you know, a bit of a blank canvas. I'll, I'll stick some links in the chat box and uh, we can follow that up, can't we, um, Erica, in, in follow-up emails to everybody as well uh, with that information. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, okay. Was mind. there was there another part of that question that I've not fully answered? If so, no, just remind. No, I think I think you've you have answered that. Okay. Answered, yeah, thank you. So, um, next question was from Helen uh, regarding funding for forest schools. Helen, are you still around? And if so, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a your question? Yeah. Hi. Um, we have a forest school. It's um, been completely destroyed from the storm. <laughs> Um, because there was no buildings and it's not any risk of life, we can't get any support from, we can't get insurance through it. And I just want to know, is there any funding available to help with the clearing of the site and replanting? Okay. Where, whereabouts is it, Helen? Wooler. Wooler, okay. Um, so there's, as some of you might be aware, um, there's, a, there's an initiative called 
the Great Northumberland Forest now, um, shortened as GNF, that, that launched uh, late last year. And there's a team being assembled led by a guy called Mark Child. And they are look, they're currently looking at ways in which they can support forestry activity in Northumberland. Um, for, th for things like you've described, Helen, that it's not currently easy to get any funding for, but nevertheless, it's worthwhile doing. So the, the question earlier, for example, about the 2.63 hectare woodland, I don't know whether that was in Northumberland, but um, there may well be scope for some support from Mark Child and his team um, for, for, for that as well. And I think someone mentioned if you're in a national park or, or an AMB, there might be support through the national park or AMB um, advisors. So in your particular case, um, I'd, I'd recommend, Helen, you, you, you contact Great Northumberland Forest. Um, it's an initiative hosted by Northumberland County Council. Um, perhaps that's another link we link to the website, Will, we can include in the information that goes out following this. I can't make any promises, Helen, um, but they might be able to help. They, they're they about to recruit a lady who was previously working in environmental education at um, Newcastle Girls High School, who is pretty passionate about um, forest schools and, 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 and utilising woodland for their educational purposes. So with her guidance and enthusiasm, there may be something they can do to Lovely, thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, thanks for that, Richard. Um, next question from Mark Shipperly. Mark, if you're around and want to unmute yourself, you have a question about coppice management. Yeah, hi, Richard. Um, yeah. I, you did mention it briefly, but we've got we, we've got uh, seven hectares, so we coppice about 0 0.8 hectares a year, and most of it's coppice restoration, so we're not cutting out bean poles and stuff. And I'm just trying to balance whether if we only have to measure the stuff that's over for 15 centimetres to see if that comes past the five cubic metres. Because obviously we only cut into two quarters of the year, uh, if we're lucky. And it's how, how we juggle that and really whether we should be putting a, a full management plan together for the commission. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's, I could answer that in two ways, I guess. Um, I, I mean, the, the first... The first way of answering it is to, is to answer it with a question. And Mark, would would you find it helpful to have a woodland management plan? And if um, the answer to that is yes, then you kind of may as well get one, and then you could be covered for the next ten years in terms of any felon license requirements and not have to kind of worry about it. Yeah, I don't think so because we don't have the rights on the standards. So the oaks and stuff, if they're coming out, they'll come out through the owner. We just have a well, it's an adjusted firewood sales lease basically to give us the coppicing rights just on the okay. coppice stools. So we don't okay. we don't really need a management plan for our part. No, okay, understood. So in that in that case, yeah, you're right. You you, you only need to be concerned about any kind of stored coppice. So that that's more than fifteen centimeters or or six inch yeah. diameter. And, and whether you'd be cutting more than five cubic meters in any calendar quarter. Of course, if you if you if you time things right, you can cut five cubic meters one day and another five cubic meters yeah. next, next day and still not exceed the thresholds. Yeah, we try um, and juggle pre and post Christmas, basically. Yeah. 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 And and okay. I suppose it, it's always I don't know whether you I don't know whether it where this is and who your local wooden officer is, but. Um, Making the local woodland officer aware of what you're doing is always useful, just in case someone calls in and says, "Look, there's felling going on. Is there a license on this?" Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So have, having that awareness is always is always. Useful. All right. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just just to add, you know, the the reason why the the six centimetre diameter for coppice was introduced as an exemption way back in 1967 when the regulations were drafted was in order to enable normal in rotation coppicing to carry on without the bureaucracy of felling licenses. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think the six, the six centimeters or sorry, the six inches or 15 centimeter guidance was judged to be the point at which it, it's kind of no longer coppice and, and is um, of a size that it could be deemed overstood or going towards high forest and, 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 and yeah. probably therefore needing coppicing or, or um, 
kind of restoration in a more formal sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's partly because it's restoration first time round, obviously, that you do end up with some bigger chunks of timber. But yeah, I think we can get round it. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, and, and thank you, Richard, again. Um, right, there was a question from Joe about removing rhododendron, saying if not diseased and replanting with natives. Um, I think that was when it came under the tree health grant. I think I'm right in saying, Richard, that the, the grant is for removal of rhododendron full stop. The rhododendron itself doesn't have to be diseased. Is that is that right? Or oh, sorry, I'm uh, grant, sorry. In, in situations where the rhododendron, if not infected, presents a risk of infection as a host species, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So it wouldn't be. So, for example, if there were no signs of phytophthora in an area, we couldn't pay the tree health grant just for rhododendron clearance because it doesn't present an immediate disease yeah. threat. Yeah. But we could, we could, however, fund rhododendron clearance um, as long as there's a management plan on the woodland as part of higher tier grant aided activity, CSI tier grant aided activity. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there's as, as well as it being eligible as among other activities associated being kind of just normal woodland management that would attract the annual payment. There's also a capital grant available if, if rhododendron is a particular problem. Yeah, okay, good, all right, thanks Richard. Um, Joe, if, if you need any further clarification on that issue, then um, if you want to get in contact with us, um, if, if you... Um, reply to Erica's email that had the invite on we'll, we'll give, give you some further advice on that one anyway yeah. as Richard said it does depend slightly on the circumstances but um yeah it sounds like you should be able to do something anyway so um Andrew McManus you had a question about Ash Dieback are you still around Andrew if so you'd like to unmute yourself ask your question uh yeah I think I've unmuted um Yep. My local common has quite a bit, an area that's going to need some ash dieback for felling. So um, uh, I was wondering if, if that same um, uh, disease um, ma disease management grant uh, would um, apply. Yes, in principle, um, ash. I think I saw the original question on the chat. Yeah, ash ash dieback is among the diseases that uh, were would be eligible for consideration for, for, for tree, tree health funding. So y yes, how, in principle. How, uh, how, how much money is involved in that? I don't know whether you remember the slide with the different different grant rates. So there's, oh, really? yeah, there's, it's, it's not a question I can answer very simply because it's a kind of sliding, <laughs> slide, sliding, sliding scale depending gotcha. on the type of woodland and whether and the rest, restoration and what's been replanted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, gotcha, but, gotcha. but but perhaps look back at that slide, and if you've still got questions, have a look at the more detailed information that's available on the website. Yeah, will do. Will do. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, John W. You had a question regarding how volume of felled timber is assessed. If you're there, would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, can you find it? Coming through, all right. Yes, we, we've got a very small woodland. It's it's less than it's about a hectare, but there's a bit of open space in the middle of it, so it's a bit less. Which we planted about 25 years ago, and we don't do much to it, but we do take out the odd birch tree, which is intrusive. It's overcrowding other trees. Um, we get a pile of logs and a lot, a lot of brushwood and stuff. Um, how do you assess how much volume you've actually taken down? <laughs> um, this this whole book's written on. Forest menstruation, so I'll try and answer it, oh, as, sorry, sorry. I, I try and answer it as, as simply as I can. Um, I mean, I don't know how to I'd answer this simply. There's, there's, there's a variety of different methods that can be used to make a, a reasonably reliable estimate of, of, of volume. And they, they, they're normally based on the principle that, that, that a log is, to all intents and purposes, a cylinder. So if you measure the diameter, and you measure the length, you can calculate the volume. Right. Yeah. So basic right. kind of geometry. Yeah. Um, so it's the, it's the volume of solid wood, and does it go down to every size of twig, or does it stop on a particular? No, diameter? it's 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 the volume of solid wood 
down to a seven centimeter top diameter. Right. right. So, so you don't need to measure anything beyond that um, seven centimeter diameter. And you can buy some very nifty tapes that are calibrated such that you wrap the tape measure around the tree or the log and the figure that it gives you is the diameter of the tree, not the circumference. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're called a DBH tape in, in forestry parlance. Um, so if you're wanting to make, and they're, you know, they're readily available and cheap to buy. If you're wanting to make a, a quick estimates of volume, they're very handy things to, to have, along with a, a, a kind of logger's tape measure you know, that will allow you to, to quickly measure the length of, of logs. And I think with those two things, the loggers tape and DBH tape, you could very quickly get a reasonably est reasonably good estimate of the, um, of the volume I, of a stack of wood. I now know the principle. Thank you very much indeed for that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your question, John. Uh, um, right, I think, um, I think that's all of the questions dealt with. Uh, we've, a few other points were made in the chat. Hopefully you've all been able to pick up on those. Um, we've got a record of them anyway, so um, if you've got any queries afterwards, then uh, then do please let us know. Um, but it is now, what is it, five past six nearly, so we've just rolled around slightly, but I think we'll call it a day there. Um, so thank you again to Richard for um, dealing with those and, and talking to the slides and, and dealing with the questions there. As I said, we will be putting the webinar on YouTube, uh, that will go on there in the next few days so um if you if you do want to watch it again or pick up any of the questions or, or chat or anything then you can you can always have another look and we'll be sending you a link to that along with an invitation to next week's webinar um just uh, to say thank you very much to all of you for attending this evening i hope you found it useful and interesting and look forward to seeing you next week um have a good evening everybody thank you very much good night goodbye thanks all